How's it going, everybody? My name is Job Greenall. Job Greenall. And I am going to be presenting on image formation by lenses. Ain't that great? Something we just learned about. So, um, hopefully you remember a little bit from class, but I'll, uh, I'll try and teach uh, to my best ability and help you understand um, whatever it was that was not communicated as clearly as you desired in class. So, we'll start by asking why do we care about lenses? Um, well, we use them every day. Um, I wear glasses and um, I actually have one eye that's nearsighted and one eye that's farsighted. Um, and it is, um, it's difficult to get by in a day without them. So, uh, obviously everyone has, well, almost everyone has cameras on their cell phones, and, uh, those are getting a little out of hand lately, but, uh, yeah, we all use them, and they all make a difference in our lives. How do I get this little bar to hide? Oh, well. So, where does the name lens come from originally? Um, it comes from the Latin word for a lentil bean. You can see a little pile of lentil beans over here, and you can see this is one lentil bean. And you can kind of see it looks like a lens. So that's cool, kind of. But, uh, yeah, so that's where the name comes from, and uh, this is why they're important to us. So... We have two types of lenses that we've talked about in class so far, and two types that we're going to focus on. We have the convex lens, also known as the converging lens. Uh, because of its converging effect it has on light, and uh, like our lovely teacher explained in class, he had his cute little uh, analogy to being pregnant, but I'm going to stay away from that because I have a different one. Um, so that's our convex lens, and then we have our concave lens, which is known as the diverging lens for its diverging effect it has on light rays. And the concave lens, I can remember that it's concave because it's like a cave that you could go into, right? The convex you can't go into, but the concave you can because it's like a cave. Pretty stupid, but nonetheless... If it helps you remember it, it helps you remember it. So, I got this cool video here that I found. I was trying to see if I could find another example, but this guy probably has our best example of uh, converging and diverging lenses. So, let's watch this real quick, and it'll give us a little example of how it bends light. It is set up for us to investigate the behavior of light as they pass through a converging lens. So I have a parallel beam of light here. When I place a thin converging lens here, the ray that is parallel to the principal axis, it will bend and cut the focal point. And the ray that cuts through the optical center, it will go straight through without bending. Okay, when I place a diverging lens here, the ray will diverge outwards. And if you retrace back the ray, this point where the ray will converge, this is the principal focal or the focal point. So that was cool. Um, I I like that because it helped us to be able to see um, where the rays converge. So the next point he mentioned in that video, our lovely assistant there mentioned that the focal point is somewhere out here, and that's the point at which the rays cross. So, to, based on the lens, the focal point can change, and the focal point's distance from the center of the lens is called the focal length. So, the focal length is the distance from the center of the lens to the focal point, as I just said. Um, and on converging lenses, the convex lenses, we have our focal point out here, and we can also have one on the other side. Um, and let's see here. Let's go on to the next slide. The power of a lens is the effect that it has to 
um, the, the effect that the lens has on light rays. Uh, and this is defined as um, one divided by focal length. So it's measured in the units of diopters when the focal length is given in meters. So it has to be in meters in order for you to calculate into diopters correctly. Um, optometrists prescribe our glasses and our contact lenses in units of diopters, which I didn't know. I thought that was kind of cool because I never really understood um, from wearing glasses my whole life what the prescription was he was giving me, and now I can understand a little bit better. So now we're going to watch this video here. Um, this guy has this huge, uh, huge lens. And hopefully it lets me start it at the 56 second mark, but I don't know if it will. I positioned my frame and found the focal point, then added some concrete tiles as a base for my projects. Okay, I've got power, and I'll test it out with this piece of wood. And when the light makes contact, I've got instant fire. The sunlight at this spot is around 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, enough to melt this spot of concrete into a glowing orange liquid. I'm curious to see what I can do with all this heat, so I fill the glass bottle with water, and I'll punch a hole in the cap. It's incredible to see that the instant I focus my lens on the bottle, it starts smoking. Just a few moments later, this water is so hot it's boiling, and I'm a little nervous the bottle might blow. Yep, there it goes. The glass pieces are melting, and that's cool, but now I want to try this on some food. I'll get some hot dogs, and when they hit the meat, they really do get hot. This might be a little well done for my taste, and I'm still hungry, so let's try an egg. The egg is actually working very well. It's so reflective it doesn't burn as fast, and even my wife is interested. A little salt and pepper, and it's tempting to try a bite. Okay, so I wasn't actually expecting to eat this, but it looks safe enough, and even my kids are anxious to try. Surprisingly, it's pretty good. Alright, let's see what... Well, that's pretty cool. If you want to watch more of that, just uh, you can go ahead and find that on YouTube yourself and see the thing. But that's a good example of the power of lens. So a lot of us, um, well, maybe not a lot of us, but some of us as kids had magnifying glasses and went outside and burned leaves or ants or whatever you were watching that video. What else this will do? Oh, I'll try it. All right. So now onward to the thin lens. So. A thin lens is defined as one to whose thickness allows rays to refract, but does not allow properties such as dispersion and aberrations. An idea, ideal thin lens has two refracting surfaces, but the lens is thin enough to assume that light rays bend only once. And this is important in lots of our problems that we do in class and for the homework. And this is mainly what we will focus on uh, going forward. So, if you look over here, we have ourselves a thin lens, and it's a convex lens. Um, and we're going to draw our, our ray lines, right? So you first start by drawing a ray going into the top, um, just hitting it directly parallel. Um, and when it exits the lens, it then passes through the focal point and continues out. And you draw these with straight lines. The second uh, ray line that we're going to draw goes directly through the center of the lens, and because it goes through the center, it comes out straight as well. So you can draw that as a perfectly straight line. And the third hits the focal point in front of the lens, and then goes through the lens and exits parallel. And when you do this, oh, sorry, you can actually determine the same point at which the light is emitted over here on this side of the lens, where it will exit and where it will all converge. Um, and produce the same image. So her head here would be produced over here. Um, so a real image is the image in which light rays from one point on the object actually cross at the location of the image and can be projected onto a screen, a piece of film, or the retina of an eye. So we're going to come back to this um, in another slide, but um, just for definition's sake, that's what a real image is. DO is defined as the distance of an object from the center of a lens. So DO in this case would be this right here. So you see it here, the actual distance of her from the lens, the center of the lens. DI is defined as the distance of the image from, from the center of the lens. So the image, not her herself, but the image, this over here, her image from the center of the lens. So that's DI. HI is the height of the image produced. So we have this little image here, if you can see that, I'm not sure how well that's showing, um, is HI. The image is the height of the image there, HI. HO is the actual height of the object, so her right here, pretty obvious, HO. And M is the, the 
ooh, that should say ratio, I'm sorry, the ratio of image height to object height and is known as magnification. So HI divided by HO gives you magnification. So that we have two thin lines equations that we learned in class and that I'm showing here. Um, and you can use those to find the magnification, or if you're given a subset, you can solve for the other. And there's many problems unless you'll be able to use this and apply this. So we went over case one images before, and this comes from, uh, this has to do with real images. So they're formed by converging lenses when the object is farther from the lens than its focal, focal length, and the focal length is a positive distance. So movie projectors, cameras, and the eye. And you can see here, this guy is actually, he's holding up a converging lens, as you can see, and he, the object, is farther from the lens than its focal length. And you can't really tell where the focal length is, but this is a good example of a case one image. So a case two image is formed by a converging lens when the object is closer to the lens than its focal length. So this is like the same thing here. He's got a lens, um, a, con a convex lens, and he's holding it up, and he's actually closer than its focal length. If we were to actually flip this picture sideways and look at him from a sideways view, you would be able to see that the focal length is closer to the lens than its focal length. And this produces a magnification effect and is also considered a virtual image. And we'll go over that in just a minute. Case three images are formed by diverging concave lenses. Um, the focal length must be negative, so it must be on the same side as the image. This produces a virtual image as well. And you can see here, this is a uh, normal glasses. Um, they look like they're old glasses, but um, yes. So what is meant by real and virtual images? So a virtual image is an image that is on the same side of the lens and the object cannot be produced on the screen. So like in this case here, the, so you can see the image is produced on the same side and that is a virtual image, right? So it's formed by, um, sorry, yeah, so to go back over this, so we talked about in class, um, it was a little bit confusing um, when we talked about case one, case two, and case three type images, um, but it's easy, easier when you look at it from the perspective of, of using the the distance of the image and the distance of the object and which side it's being produced on. So if you look here again, the focal length is positive, which means that it's positive on the other side and the, the distance of the objects is greater than the focal length. And that's like the case one where you saw where he was holding it out and he's farther away from the focal length than um, the actual lens and the magnification is negative. He's smaller and he's flipped. Case two is the distance of the object is less than the focal length. So he was closer and it was a positive magnification. So case three is the focal length is negative. So it's on the opposite side of the lens and it creates a positive magnification. And the distance of the image is negative. So that's all I have time for today. Hopefully you enjoyed that and I gave you some sort of uh, clarity to images produced by lenses.